self-publishing. I want to talk about this first. Um, because it is a little bit of an elephant in the room with all publication business discussions these days. Um, and that is because if you haven't been following along, which I assume most of you haven't, if you haven't been following along, the ebook explosion has happened. Uh, finally, after being predicted for 10 years and never quite making it, it happened. Um, I went from uh, Hero of Ages, uh, in, a, in a given quarter, sold nine copies um, on ebook, one, one quarter, or one, I guess, half of a year, so one, one royalty statement, so one six month period, to jumping up to selling something like 15,000 in one six month period, okay? All right, when, um, so that's not a very <laughs> long time. Um, Alloy of Law sold 17,000 um, copies, 10,000 of which were ebook copy, and 7,000 of which were hardcover copy in its opening week. Okay? Um, so I am now shifted to more ebook than non ebook in my sales, which is really, I tell you, throw a crimp in me trying to track things. So I used to get book scan every week, I still get book scan every week, but now it's basically meaningless because I have no idea on the back end what the ebooks are selling because you only get those every six months because um, book scan doesn't track those yet. So it's really, really confusing to understand what things are selling what. Um, Good Kind sold 17,000 in his last book, um, which is a, in hardcover, which is a really solid number, um, and, and made number one on the New York Times list. I made number seven selling 7,000 hardcover, 10,000 ebook. They were different months. And so you, it's, it's so hard to tell nowadays what means what as a sale. Do you think part of that might be because you released the first few chapters on ebook for free earlier? Maybe. I don't know. I think the main part of it is that uh, science fiction fantasy people also overlap with tech people who early adopt. And now we're out of the early adopter stage. If you know anything about how things go, we're way out of the early adop adopter stage and we're um, into the, the mass. Um, we're not into the you know the next stage, which is ubiquitous um, access, but we are into the all Everyone who's interested in technology, even slightly, has something now that reads ebooks, uh, and has probably experimented with them. Um, and so, because that group overlaps so strongly, science fiction and fantasy, um, we see a lot of, uh, of early adopting. But ebooks are weird in a lot of ways. Number one, and this this is one of the main mark, um, the only times where older people are part of the early adopter group, because ebooks can change font size. And so those who had to have large print books can now have an e-reader. So that makes them that makes them actually very weird. Um, you know, a lot of also people who read disposable books rather than just the tech geeks like these people who read um, who read a lot while they're traveling. Uh, I think this turned off. It's not good. As long as it's not bad. The camera's recording? Okay. Um, so, the other thing is that, um, <coughs> that people who read disposable books, so housewives, love e-readers because those, that's one of the largest reading segments of the population, and um, they read the romance novels on the e-books, um, on the e-readers. Uh, you no longer have to worry about the weird cover of your book um, and things like that. And so, anyway, it's changing, it's changing the market a lot. Alongside the concept of e-readers is the concept that, do um, you want to set it down again? Uh, I will. I'm going to change the battery. Okay. Um, the concept that you can self-publish much more easily than you used to be able to. To self-publish even 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, but 10 years ago certainly, required a large input of capital. Um, and you would end up with lots of books in your, in your garage, and it was a difficult thing to do. Um, even when the POD started taking off, right before the ebook um, launch, POD is where you would like go to the website and you could order a copy of the book and they would print it and send it to you. So you could self-publish by having just a website there for your page and everyone who bought it, the, the company just shipped it to them. Even that was a little bit hard because the, um, the POD books had to be costed at a level of um, way, well above what a comparable book by um, a New York publisher could be because of print run sizes. And so instead of paying 
you know, twelve dollars for um, um for a book, uh, a comic book, you'd have to pay twenty dollars, and so that made it really hard for the self-published people. They either had to price their book at such a point that they were making no money, which they normally would have, they would end up doing, um, or they would have to price it so high that no one's going to buy it except their friends and family. Um, and so this self-publishing was really, really hard until ebooks took off. Now, um, there is no capital investment to ebook um, publishing, um, no, no, re no necessary capital investment um, to ebook publishing, and so it's become a lot easier. And so a, a, a big revolution is happening where people, I, I mentioned several websites for you to read, big revolution is happening where everyone is saying, why not just self-publish yourself? Why not skip the middleman of the publisher? Why not do this all yourself and put it up on Kindle, iBooks, um, Kobo, and um, Barnes and Noble, um, and sell it yourself? Um, yeah, but wouldn't it still be worth it to invest some capital and maybe like a good? We're going to talk about that. Week? We will talk about all of this. Okay. Don't worry. Um, but you can do it for nothing. You can do it for nothing um, if you want to. Um, and the royalties paid to you are 70 percent, um, as long as your book's priced between $2.99 and $9.99 um, $9 on Amazon, you get um, you get it there. Um, the, the royalties, I think, on iBooks and um, the others are actually just it doesn't matter what your price is. You basically you get like 60 set, 65, 70. It's uh, somewhere in there for everybody. So you're making 70 percent of the cover price yourself. And there are several large-scale success stories of this happening. The one that people mention a lot is Amanda Hawking. She's kind of old news now. Um, not that, it, you know, I mean, she's still publishing things, but I, I think that there have been several that have come that I haven't noticed since her who have done the same thing. Um, but you can read about Amanda Hawking. Um, the thing that I want to point I want to make to you um, is that despite all of this, I really feel, and this might be a controversial statement, that self-publishing has not changed. Um, it has not changed from 20 years ago. It's become easier, but the fundamentals have not changed. Um, Self-publishing had um, a stigma for a long time. I don't think it ever deserved it. There were always good reasons to self-publish, and there are still good reasons to self-publish. However, the fact that it is easier to do so does not change. Your main hurdle is that you have to do everything yourself. Okay. And this can be an argument for or against self-publishing, okay? If you are really excited about the concept of doing everything yourself, and we'll talk about what everything entails, then this can be a big plus. I know for a lot of people who like doing, um, who, who are indie publishing, and I do like that term, even though some in um, traditional publishing don't. I do think it's a good term. Um, that doing everything yourself, they're excited by that concept, having, um, having control over their cover, having control over um, editorial, having control over their marketing, that makes them excited. Um, number two, um, shelf space, which now gets, quote, um, gets quotes around it, is your biggest problem. And that means that in the sea of new books coming out, you have a very, every writer, new writer, has an uphill battle. The uphill battle is much greater for the self-published writer. It always has been. That's because you don't have the publisher's marketing um, team behind you. You don't have the publisher's seal of stamp of, this is a book done by Tor, um, that, that there are legitimate number of people that recognize and say, OK, Tor does good books. I will try this book as well. You don't have um, you, you just don't have any of that, and so it's a very uphill battle for you. Um, if you look at almost all self-publishing success stories. They have happened because the person has a good platform, okay? 
in self-publishing, this works really well, even in, um, in traditional publishing, but I, you, you see it um, a lot more in this, a platform. Meaning, you have a spin on selling your book, which is going to make, um, which is going to help you. Um, the poster child for this recently was, uh, was Larry Correa. Uh, we did some Riot Excuses episodes with him, you can listen to them. He was self-published um, for a while and did very well at it. Very well meaning, uh, this was before the ebook revolution. And he sold like two or 3,000 copies of his book, which is actually a really solid number for a locally, regionally published. He may have gotten even higher than that. You have to ask him. Um, he, he may have gotten as high as like 10 grand um, in sales uh, as a self-published writer. What Larry Correa did was he is a gun nut. He's a, he loves guns. He loves types of guns. Um, he belongs to a lot of gun listservs, gun bulletin boards, all of these things. And he sat down and said, there, I want to write urban fantasy novels, you know, like Men in Black or like Harry Dresden, these sorts of things, except I want them, everyone who's out there killing monsters, to be using awesome guns written toward all the people who have awesome guns and know all about the awesome guns. And I will spend pages telling you about the awesome guns so you can say, yeah, that's an awesome gun. <laughs> um, and he wrote books. That's, that's basically what Monster Hunter was. Um, and they were well written. And they had lots of guns. <laughs> and then he went on all these listers and said, hey guys, I wrote this book for you. To the Baltimore's. Hey guys, you've known me for years. I'm not just some guy who's spamming the board with his, his new thing, thing to show. I've been a participant. You all know me. I've written this book for you guys. I think you should look at it. And he leveraged his platform in a wonderful way, knew his market, targeted his market, knew how to market it to them, and sold a ton of books. Then he, when he got a chance for a New York publishing deal, he took it and he explains why um, on writing excuses. Um, but the platform was extremely helpful for him. Another person who did a very good job of this was Christopher Paolini. His platform was, I'm 15 and I wrote this book, um, which he did. Um, his family then self-published it. And um, contrary to rumors, they didn't own a publishing company. A lot of people think that. What they did is they started a company, um, which a lot of self-published people do. Um, even a lot of, you know, I started a company for my books to, to then hold the, the copyrights and things. And they started a company, and they, they did the school of zip route, which is very successful, though a little bit oversaturated, well, a lot oversaturated in um, children's right now, YA, um, and middle grade in particular. That is where he would go to a new city, he would do assemblies in a bunch of different uh, schools during the day and then sell the books there. And he did hundreds of those and started a grassroots campaign with his platform being, I'm your age, you could do this too, let's talk about how we write and let me give you a cool assembly on being a writer as a team. Uh, had, he had a great presentation, people really latched onto it, they started reading his books, they liked his books, they were written for kids, by kids, sort of thing, um, and he took off. Um, but if you talk to Christopher, it's that platform that really got him that extra distance. And in self-publishing, a lot of these success stories come out of the platform. Whether the platform is Joe Conrad's, um, I was a pro, who now has gone indie, and let me talk about the indie process. He's very much an expert on it. He has a big blog where he public, uh, posts very frequently on topics relating to this, and his platform is indie publishing is awesome, and you should try it. Uh, and he has leveraged that into an enormous platform. Um, he also happens to be a very good writer for, uh, for you know, good writer of the types of books he is promoting, and he took off before he had that platform, um, I, I think, but he certainly has leveraged it very well. So if you are going to self-publish, you have to market a lot. Now, it's, um, <coughs> it's said in publishing these days that you have to market a lot no matter what. And that is true. However, as a self-published writer, um, the big thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to find a way to draw attention to yourself and to your novel. And most people are doing this by having a very interesting blog that is written about some topic that relates to their books, but is not about their books. If pe people are not going to keep reading if your, um, if your blog is just a big marketing thing for your books. Now, that's basically kind of what my blog is, because my blog is not there to generate 
um, people reading my books. Um, my blog is there for fans of my books to come and get extra information. So my, mine is like, you know, that, that, that's a very different thing from the, I am going to write a really cool blog and draw attention to myself and then sell my book as a side product of in, people coming to my blog and being interested by it. And that is, um, that is all about marketing. I don't think any of this has changed from 20 years ago. Um, what has changed is that it is now easier. And I do think your chances of being able to make it have gone up many times. Um, even before, because of the huge investment of capital you had to do uh, to, to publish a book, even if you had a lot of this stuff, it was really rough going. Now it's still rough going, but the really is kind of dropped out, and it is a viable alternative to publishing in New York. Um, quite viable. If you're willing to do this stuff, um, I would send anyone who is excited by doing everything, which again we're just going to talk about in a minute, who, um, who recognizes your biggest challenges and has got a platform in mind and um, is willing to market, then this is a good choice for you. If that is not what you want to do, then I would suggest still researching and learning about these things, but the hype is going to ignore that this is a bad match for you if these things are things that make you wince, okay?